like him, everybody. And, and thanks for, for joining us. Um, uh, you know, I think as, as Muslim chaplains, there really is uh, a connective tissue kind of role that you all play um, at various institutions um, between, you know, patients, between folks that are in prisons and jails, at schools, on campus, and, you know, our community, or uh, even in establishing community in our space. And so I think it's, it, it, people are going to look to you all to understand what, you know, everybody's rights are in these situations. And this is not an easy area. This area, it's going to depend on where you are, whether you're employed by a public institution or a private institution. And so um, uh, just like I'll care for inviting us and, and taking the time um, to study these issues as, as we have been studying them for the past four months um, in, in the wake of the um, of October 7th and, and all that's come um, from it. So if you go to the next slide, Shrook. So um, we're gonna start off with just the kinds of things that we're seeing um, uh, from folks uh, in, in our community. Um, you know, we're seeing folks get fired um, for their social media comments. Um, uh, folks being told not to speak about this or not to wear that. Um, uh, and when it's not, you know, punitive, it's at least censorious. You know, we're going to warn you about uh, not doing this, that, or the other thing. And we're also seeing different kinds of political opinions. This will come as a surprise to no one on this call today, but we're seeing different kinds of political opinions get treated differently, not because of how they're expressed or when they're expressed, but because of the political message that they contain themselves. Um, let's go to the next slide. So uh, Kim is gonna, in a little bit, talk about some of the private employee rights. I'm gonna talk about public employee rights. Public employees have more rights than private employees. I'm gonna say that again. Uh, public employees, if you're employed by a county hospital, if you're employed by a, uh, a prison, if you're employed by the military, let's say, those are all public entities. Um, if it's the federal government, you know, if it's the military, you know, that's a public entity. If it's a local jail or a county hospital, that's also a public entity. It doesn't matter whether it's the federal government or whether it's the state government. If it's part of the government, then it's a public entity. And if you are employed by that public entity, that means you are a public employee protected by the First Amendment. Okay, you're a public employee protected by the First Amendment. If you're not a public employee, then you are not protected by the First Amendment, okay? That's why Brandeis University, a private religious university, was able to shut down their SJP, the Students for Justice in Palestine, but the University of South Florida, University of Florida were not. That's why Columbia was able to, and University of South Florida was not able to. Um, a, a public employee has the ability to speak out on certain manners in certain ways, and it's illegal for a public employee to be fired if they follow these general parameters, okay? If you are speaking during the work day in your place of public employee employment, if you're a doctor at a county hospital, for example, let me give you a, a concrete example. Doctor at a county hospital says, I want to, he's a surgeon, he says, I want to wear my kafia to the OR. I want to do it. This is how I want, it, it means a lot to me. I want to wear it in, in the OR. Can the county hospital fire the surgeon for wearing the kafia at the hospital? You're not going to like this answer, but the answer depends because during the workday, that's when your employer, even if it's a public employer, has the most authority over the things that you say and do. 
in the workday, at the workplace, an employer, even a public employer, has a greater ability to impact what it is you can do and can't do in that workplace. And the general thing that they're going to look for is, is the employer, are they treating everybody the same way? If they're not allowing any kinds of political or national kind of expressions in the OR, then probably that's going to be okay. If they're allowing some kinds but not others, then it might not be okay. But if you're at the workplace speaking during the workday, your freedom is, is lower than if you are outside of the workplace speaking as a public citizen, okay, as, as a citizen, okay, as a private citizen. If you're outside of the workplace and you're not, let's say, standing behind your logo of your workplace as you're talking, okay, let's say you work for the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, I think they might have a chaplain or two there. Let's say you work for the EPA and then at night, as you go home from your job at the agency, you're gonna do a live stream on Twitter about the latest war crime. Don't have behind you an EPA logo. Don't wear on you something that has your company logo on it. Because if there's something to identify you as an employee of this public agency, then it might not be considered you speaking as a private citizen, even if it's just like a little logo that you have. So if you are going to talk, speak out, as so many of folks in our community have, do it with wisdom. Do it in a way where your employer's logo is not visible anywhere on your live stream. And then this final part, this your speech doesn't interfere with your job. Okay, this is, you know, there's a practical reality to the First Amendment, and I think it's expressed in this third prong of even your speech as a private citizen. And even when that speech is done outside of the workplace, even that speech, possibly, it's possible that that kind of speech might interfere with your job. What kinds of things might you say? outside of work that could affect your job at work. Let me give you a specific example from real life from a public employee. Okay, a public employee in Illinois, just a week or two after October 7th, um, was engaging with, I, I, think the, I think the name of the account was Big Boy's Law. It was like a, a, a pseudonymous, a uh, social media account. And that so synonymous social media account was saying vulgar things. And the person, this Muslim sister responded to that person uncharacteristically with words that she regretted, I think as soon as she said them, but she's the, the I think the language was like, um, and again, I'm quoting her. I'm not, this is not my words. I, she was alleged to have said something about her wish that more people died in the Holocaust. You can imagine if you have a position of responsibility, right? Especially as like a chaplain, if you're if you're if if you're in a privileged position of authority, if you're supervising folks, there are just certain things that you can't express. And that's one of them, I think, kind of black and white. Other things that I think are particular to chaplains are because you're a lot of times, especially as public chaplains, you're serving a, a almost like a public role. You're bringing religious services to those that you're acquired by law, by federal law, um, uh, to, to provide, it doesn't have to be quite as outrageous as 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 that um, a person in Illinois who was 
you know, terminated and she was terminated, even though what she said was outside of work hours, there was no connection. There was no, is is not like she identified herself as working for the public agency, but it's that the comment itself um, uh, promised to interfere with her job later. Those are the general things. And if we can go to the next slide. Those are the general things, but there are laws that are specific to certain places or sometimes even certain issues. California, for example, has a law that makes it um, protects, you know, attending uh, political protests in specific. Um, uh, and that uh, is, you know, across topics. Utah has a specific protection for um, uh, uh, a political expression around um, uh, same-sex, opposite-sex marriage. Uh, um, and so there are particular protections in Utah and California and other places um, regarding what an employee can say um, uh, while still being protected and what an employee can do. Um, but the reason that all of these things are against the law is because the law is often or sometimes violated. And so we don't want to just talk about the First Amendment and public employees. We want to talk about, if we go to the next slide, we want to also talk about private employees. Now, all the protections that a private employee has are uh, apply to public employees as well. It's just the case that the protections for public employees tend to be broader. And so Kim is going to speak to us about Title VII and understand that the things that she's speaking about all are narrower. They're more narrow than the public employee protections. And so if you're a public employee, you're better protected than you're for a private employee. If you're a private employee, you need to understand while there are some protections for you that Kim's gonna discuss, that those protections are less than what the constitution provides. Okay, go ahead, Kim. Okay, hi everybody, um, I'm Kim and uh, I'm a staff attorney at CARE Legal Defense Fund. So Gadir is absolutely right. Um, private employees speech is not specifically protected in the workplace, but Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 does protect employees, private employees, from uh, discriminatory employment actions. So to explain that, for example, uh, as you see on the slide, you're protected um, from unfair hiring, firing, and promotional practices. So your employer cannot uh, consider your religion, race, national origin when making decisions affecting your employment status. Um, the, the policies have to be applied in an equal and fair manner. So that protects you from being treated differently from your colleagues for the same conduct, which can include speech and social media. We have a case uh, right now in uh, Maryland involving a teacher who had um, a, a pro-Palestinian slogan in her email signature. Um, she was uh, um, negatively affected by that and by her school district, but she's been able to show that other employees have been able to espouse other political movements um, in the same way, such as Black Lives Matter, and that they haven't been uh, terminated or suspended for those reasons. And so that's where Title VII really kicks in. It's where um, another employee is not given a, a negative, sorry, a negative employment action, but you are um, either for same or similar speech. So you want to um, watch for examples of other employees in the workplace, uh, whether it's the speech is about um, other political movements like the example I just gave, or whether they're maybe making similar 
um, social media posts or whatever as you are, but they're on the Israel side, for example, of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, if, if you're being punished for the same action and they're not, that's a viewpoint based issue that that uh, brings discrimination into the into the equation. And here the big difference between Title VII and the First Amendment is that Title VII is protecting you from unfair treatment, from disparate treatment when they're treating one group differently from the other. Whereas the First Amendment, is looking at, are they discriminating between viewpoints? Are they discriminating, if they're discriminating between viewpoints or treating people a particular way based on their viewpoint, then it protects that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so if we could go to the next slide. Um, so in in that way, Title then ensures a non-hostile work environment. So, um, it, it guarantees your right to report an act of discrimination without retaliation. Um, so as, as Gadir just said, Title VII does not protect speech in general, unless that speech is related to uh, discrimination by your employer. And so that's why it's so important to find examples, if, if this issue is affecting you right now, find examples of other employees in your organization who are doing similar, um, you know, making similar speech um, from a different uh, from a different vantage point or on a different issue, who have not been disciplined. Um, Title VII also protects your right to file an EEOC complaint. Um, EEOC is the Equal uh, uh, Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, you are. Uh, able to file a, a discrimination charge with the EEOC within 180 days of the date of the discrimination that happened. So make sure you're watching that time frame to protect your rights to do that. To, to, to file a complaint with the EEOC, you can just go to uh, publicportal.eeoc.gov um, and it's super easy to do. And you can also give us a call and, and, and we uh, uh, represent folks and provide legal services to folks going through the EEOC process, but it's a required step. You can't just sue your employer. You would have to file something with this administrative agency first. And a lot of times the administrative agency is dealing with complaints filed by current employees. And so it's hard. It's hard to file a, a complaint against your current employer and oftentimes people don't do that because it's just the reality filing a legal claim against your current employer creates friction it's not it's like indisputable it's gonna create friction and so people don't always do it but the eoc is set up to try to resolve employer employee complaints issues um short of litigation and so that's why how it's designed We've certainly done uh, EOC complaints for existing uh, employees. And I'll say that it generally for public employees also get a better shake at this than private employees. A private employer is just as kind of an experience is more likely to retaliate than a public employer. Go ahead. That's true. That's true. Um, so, yeah, so that's an important note to Title VII protects uh, from from retaliation um, if you filed a, a discrimination complaint, but as we all know in the real world, sometimes things don't go the way they're supposed to. So do keep that risk in mind. But you are one hundred percent within your rights to file a complaint, um, both with your HR department and with the EEOC, and it can't be stated strongly enough before you have the right to sue, you have to exhaust the EEOC process. So make sure you're filing that EEOC charge within 180 days of the discrimination to preserve your legal claims and your legal rights. Um, but a lot of care chapters within individual states uh, represent employment claims through the EEOC process and Care National does as well. So if you don't have a local chapter or if your local 
or can't take your case, definitely um, reach out to Care National and, and we will look into it. Um, okay, go to the next slide, please, Sharuk. Okay, so th these are recommendations um, regarding Palestine specifically. So if, if your social media content, for example, has been flagged for HR, uh, you should take the following steps to prepare yourself. So um, first of all, you wanna document any conversation um, and any subsequent conversation you have with HR. Um, either ask to be given the specific policies in writing, um, and, and if, if they can't give them to you in writing, take very detailed notes. Um, you wanna also uh, provide documentation or resources from credible uh, um, human rights and grassroots organizations that explain the nature of your content. So for example, there's always a lot of confusion about uh, the, the slogan from the river to the sea. Right. And so it's important sometimes, sometimes it can alleviate the issue by just educating HR, your organization about what that really means and and to show um, sort of official sources that corroborate that. Um, if you believe your employer is treating you differently because of a protected class, like we talked about under um, Title VII, if, if it's based on your race or your religion, uh, tell HR. You want, you want to file a complaint immediately um, because that's, that's also part of the exhaustion uh, requirement going into uh, if you want to protect a right to sue later. Um, if you're a member of a union, definitely ask for support from them. Um, a union rep can can always attend HR meetings with you, and it's a great idea to have them involved early. Um, and then contact us. Uh, we'll we can help you through the process. Uh, at least give you some advice, and um, you know, be with you through that issue. If we can go to the next slide. So. I don't know, um, because I can't see you in a gallery view right now, so I can't ask for a show of hands, but um, presumably at least some of you are uh, chaplains in a prisoner jail setting. So just a quick reminder, I know this is more about your employment status, but uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't remind you that incarcerated individuals also have uh, religious protections under federal law. So prisons and jails are obligated to accommodate the religious practice of, um, of incarcerees, even if it costs the facility money in most cases. So if you see um, incarcerated Muslims in your prison or jail facility, uh, for example, denial of halal or kosher meals, um, visible clocks or timepieces in the housing unit so that they're visible from inside the cells, uh, congregational prayer, especially on Fridays for Jummah or every evening during Ramadan, especially, um, you know, access to prayer rugs, kufis, religious materials. These are all issues we've litigated and we've litigated a lot more than these, but these are specific accommodations that we have sued over and won against facilities across the country. So if you see your facility denying any of these accommodations or other accommodations um, for the, the incarcerees that you minister to, push back to the extent you can and call care. Let us know. Um, have the incarcerees reach out to us if that's something you can do or are comfortable doing. And uh, we'll be there to help both of you through the process. So I think the next slide is just our contact information. Please take this down. Feel free to reach out to us at any time if any of these issues come up for you. And we'll do the yeah. best we can to help you. Yeah, we've um, really been working with folks, you know, one-on-one -on -one and in small groups um, because these things play out differently in every single place. 
And so a lot of times, uh, you know, we want to be specific to your particular situation. And so um, please, we're all stronger um, together than we are separately. And inshallah, the things that we've learned from, you know, debacles and spectacles in one part of the country can be of use um, and value as as y'all navigate the various challenges. Um, so uh, you can see just in talking about the First Amendment and the protections that it provides public employees, Title Seven, and the protections that it provides private employees, that it leaves a lot open. There's a lot of reasons why an employer can fire you. And a savvy employer is always going to be able to come up with a reason to fire somebody or is going to be able to hide the actual reason um, uh, from from view and shield it in a way that's not um, uh, doesn't make it a litigation target. And so because the protections are weak, you have to use wisdom. You can't just go in there screaming and yelling, whatever it is that is the situation. Y'all are too important, right? We need you guys. You know, we need all of us. And so uh, there's a, a, a like, and I, we, we, I know we know this, you know, everybody knows this, but it's a strategy and you know your workplace better than anybody else. And because you know your workplace better than anybody else, you're going to be in the best position to, to navigate it. And you should navigate it thoughtfully. You should navigate it not when you're angry or feeling emotional. You should navigate it deliberately, you know, uh, uh, in a cold, calculated, rational, you know, way. And, and inshallah, in doing that, um, you can uh, avoid some of the pitfalls. Um, and we're going to open uh, the, the rest of the time up for questions um, that they all might have. Thank you so much. This was, I learned a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm kind of, yeah, being a, a private employee is a very interesting, I guess, space to be in. Um, and I know that most of what we're talking about, you know, because the internet is what it is, is social media. And I wonder how these things differ or are similar or what we should be aware of when it comes to speaking in person at work um, amongst colleagues, for example, or with those that we serve. It's all things being equal. It's better to say something than to write something down. I think that's, you know, just kind of true um, across the board. And not just because if you write something down, you know, it's like permanent. If when you're talking to somebody in person, they're going to be able probably to, to detect that you're not a bloodthirsty monster, right? Whereas if they're just looking at your words, it's going to matter what other tabs are open on the screen that they're looking at your words on. Maybe there's something that's kind of, you know, uh, forcing them to look at your words in a particular way. And so, just that practical reason, it's better to say something rather than write something. Um, it, you know, a private employer can fire you for almost any non-discrimination reason. They can fire you because your shoes, you know, they don't like them. They think that you shouldn't have on Reeboks, what, you know, they could fire you because you're a Chicago Bears fan, God forbid, you know, something like that. They could fire you for all sorts of inane, you know, dumb reasons. It's only when they cross over into the disparate treatment that they can't fire you. And so in, in talking with your colleagues, if you're at a private workplace, you really don't have a lot of protections. That's just kind of the truth of it. If somebody is inclined to, if they have it in their mind, I'm going to weaponize a conversation that I had with Mira. I'm going to weaponize it into an HR complaint and, and, try, and try to get her fired. There's not a ton of protections you have other than the, you know, good faith of your colleagues, right? So does your supervisor, does the person who you report to, do they have a good sense of you as like a, as like an honest, trustworthy 
And most importantly, in these past couple months, not bloodthirsty monster. You know, that's like, uh, you know, a lot of times if I'm if, if we're talking to a group of folks that might have it in their mind um, that maybe maybe because we're care, maybe because we represent people on the watch list, that they might think of us as dangerous. I'm conscious of that. And I try to say something, you know, in the on the front end, on the front end that let, lets them know, you know, and we're blessed in Islam, you can't kill innocent people no matter what. There's really the kind of broad protections for innocent civilians. And so, you know, just be conscious of how the other folks that you're talking to, you know, what what's in, what's going on in their head? Well, you know, where are they? And if they're, if they're somewhere where they, maybe they don't like you or they don't know enough about you to have a view on you, maybe kind of don't let somebody else inject this idea that, you know, you're a Hamas loving, you know, t you know, terrorist sympathizing, whatever it happens to be, um, you want to kind of not necessarily address it, but I think sometimes people that are skeptical of a Palestine point of view want to know that we're also for not killing innocent people. That's like also what, you know, that's that's kind of the whole point from the river to the sea, Palestine River Free. It's like, let's not, let's stop it with the innocent killing. So, you know, just thinking about putting those things up front, that's not like a legal issue. Like I, and I, it's, but it's a reflection that the legal protections are not there. And so I need to rely on my relationships with my colleagues, with my supervisor for protection. I'll just add in the example of like maybe a coworker trying to weaponize a conversation with you, um, where maybe they're trying to bait you into an argument over Palestine or Israel, which side is right. Um, this is all true that the protections are not really there for private employees, especially in the way they are for public employees, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't file a complaint or, or respond to the complaint in a way that points out that the other person who was in that conversation is not being disciplined for the same conduct, right? So that doesn't mean don't, don't try. Don't try to fight it or don't try to take action. Definitely do the things still. Other questions or comments, arguments, disagreements, they're all welcome. Every <laughs> yeah, Issa. Um, yeah, I, I think with this conversation, one thing that I always just do is to say I care about people. And I just leave it at that. I said all innocent people's lives matter. And I, I think it's like it's like kind of a very healthy, neutral position that gets you away from any of the tension personally. Yeah. 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 And if, it's almost like uh, just kind of like you're just like, let, it, let let them know, let them know and then kind of carry on. And I think a lot of folks, that's that it's enough. It's enough for them to just hear it. Yeah, I'm saddened that there's like a Muslim disclaimer, but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's it's it is sad. But you know, does you know dire times, dire measures, and you know, yeah, I, I agree. We shouldn't have to, but yeah, yeah. James, I have two more questions. Oh, yeah, oh, but I'm going to wait for Jay. I'm going to wait for Jay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Kim, um, really appreciate you guys taking the time to to be with us for this. Um, we have had some chaplains run into um, loss of their jobs. Um, and uh, concern about the potential loss of their jobs and some difficult conversations with HR. I, I'm wonder. I'm curious to know. So there's like a, there's a lot of things going around social media right now, and I'm sure that you guys are seeing those too. Are there ones like? Can you share some examples of social media posts where you see them as you know, sort of your legally trained minds being like, "Oh, that is gonna run people right into trouble. Like that was not a good idea." Some of those sort of concrete examples. Um, if you could unpack it, share those. Yeah, those yeah, yeah. So people are constantly running into issues with if you talk about israel and you talk about the nazis or germany it ends up going poorly it like a lot of times it goes poorly you know president uh lula of brazil you know had 
kind of a, a more like lengthy disquisition about that issue. And so you can imagine, you can imagine somebody giving like an hour and a half or hour lecture where they're, you know, they're, they're making some kind of point about it. But on social media, it's just not like, uh, it's not amenable to a long point. And so don't do it. Yeah, just don't do it. Just, <laughs> Nazis, I- Germany and Israel, it's just, if you're, especially if you're in a bit like uh, in kind of a Muslim identifying position on social media, it's like one thing if you're at Mass ICNA or if you're in an academic setting and you're giving like a lecture to folks and, and you're making kind of a, a really academic kind of point or a long point, but if you're just saying something or if you're just sharing something or you're just liking something, I'd say, yeah, no Nazi, no Germany. I think Zionism as well is a very valid topic. It's an important topic for people to understand, but it's like not, it doesn't lend itself to an explanation in 10 words, in 20 words. And then if you're liking or sharing something, are you signing on for everything that's in there or not in there? And so I think the Zionism uh, discussion on social media can 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 trip people up um, as well. Um, I think those are the main ones that I've, I've run into. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's like kind of topic areas as well that it's, uh, in the Muslim community, it's just not the, I think the, the best ground for us to be talking or debating about social media. Like for example, um, there's in the Israeli press, there's intense investigation of on October 7th, how many of the people that were killed were killed by the Israeli military, you know, uh, attacking how many they're trying to count. Okay. There's a number, it seems like, and we don't know what that is, you know, but I'd say that that's not a good, that's not a good strategic thing for, uh, for, you know, if you're in a position of responsibility, that's going to be easy to, for folks to kind of um, twist and mangle, uh, even, even if that there's going to be a, a state inquiry into that question in Israel. And so I, I think, what, what you have to kind of consider being like a Muslim chaplain or a Muslim in a position of responsibility, um, uh, that kind of a connective tissue between the community and these institutions is like, what's what's like strategic for me to say? Like what's uh, edu- what's actually educational for me to say? Like what, what if, if I'm talking to people in good faith, of good faith, you know, that don't see things necessarily the way that I see things, what could I say that is perhaps going to persuade them to see something a little bit differently than they do now? And I don't think, I don't think Zionism is the place to start. You know, I think that Zionism is like a really abstract concept and the place to start is with like the massacre of innocent civilians. That's the, you know, ceasefire, end of the occupation. I think those are, in my kind of view, the, easier to understand concepts that should be the basis of you know kind of interactions especially social media if you're communicating on social media you're not just communicating to your friends and family it's a public forum and you have to expect that what you say there if it's circulated to your employer if it's your colleagues to your supervisor would it be fine and a ceasefire is, is, you know, not people are not getting fired, at least now. Maybe they were in October, but right now they're not getting fired because they're calling for ceasefires on social media. I'm not seeing that. They're getting fired or they're getting suspended sometimes when they go a little bit beyond that. We are dealing with right now a, a teacher that got suspended because she put from the river to the sea and in, in her signature block, we're going to defend, she's a public employee. Other employees are including similar kinds of messages. So we're going to defend it, but she's still suspended, right? She's still suspended. And so sometimes it's a balance. I think, you know, for, for that sister, you know, she's defending, uh, 
a slogan we all know that uh, is decades, decades in the in the making. A lot of kind of cultural nationalistic capital in that phrase, you know. Um, uh, and so she's defending it, but she's defending it strategically. She's defending it on ground, on grounds that are defensible. And so, um, so yeah, it's kind of. Thank you for that. If I could just quickly mention too, it, it's it's really easy to see a meme uh, that has a great message and share it, but um, we can also fall into an issue if, you, you know, usually we share memes and don't really pay attention to the source or the author of those memes. And so it can be really helpful to just do a quick Google search of the person or the source that it came from and just make sure, you know, if 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 that author or or page or whatever it is, is espousing, you know, Hamas freedom fighters, for example, even though that is maybe a defensive, a defensible point, you know, um, it, you know, it can it can cause some problems if there's a hidden meaning in the background that we don't think to look at first. So word to the wise there. Other questions? Yeah, so the, yeah, has your hand up? So if you're there, you might be muted. We shall be back with us in a bit. I'm glad you touched on the, the Zionism point. That was my next question as to like how dangerous is it now to, you know, speak on Zionism. We, uh, to give kind of a, a story. Uh, we still can't hear you, Sadaf, um, but on the Zionism issue, you know, we had a person who was fired because, fired from a private employer because of a tweet that what disparaged kind of accurately in my view, Zionism, um, uh, even though that tweet was seven, eight years old. And so it's just an, it's an easy thing, I think, for a private employer to latch on to and say, I'm going to fire this person because of the mean thing about Zionism that they said. Where if maybe if you said something similar, but couched it in reference to the International Court of Justice says that, you know, outlined, you know, these various forms of genocide that are being perpetrated. Or, you know, now the kind of, you know, it's it's like not a day goes by where, you know, Reuters, New York Times, or there's some kind of news coverage of some grisly war crime, right? You know, just like decomposing, you know, babies, uh, you know, people shot at a hospital, uh, the uh, brother who they handcuffed and sent to the hospital and then killed when he left. You know, there's a lot of just like grisly content about the atrocities in Gaza from these kind of mainstream sources that you just like, if you're thinking about like, I'm in a, it's like one thing, I'm at care, right? I'm probably not going to get in trouble for my Palestine related tweets. You know, if you're, you know, working for a public university, there's going to be real limits to what they can do about your tweets. But if you're, if you're working for a hospital that has just fired a bunch of people for the innocuous tweets that they sent about October 7th, then you should, you should think here more carefully, maybe couch your critique of Israel uh, in, in sources that are, you know, that no one can you know dispute their their you know their um, their authority you know, ICJ UN reports um, et cetera et cetera the World Food Program I mean McCain Cindy McCain the wife uh, of John McCain is she's saying it 
everybody in God is going to start. Start. They're already starting. This is Cindy McCain saying it. And so just, you know, is, okay, have you, uh, you know, if have you uh, referred to electronic intifada, if you're circulating uh, a link from, from that website versus you're circulating um, something from NBC, wh who, wh what is your employer more likely to be able to get themselves riled up about it's it's certainly the blog over the social media post yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean so, there's no shortage of of reputable sources for any point so yeah. yeah um so i am assalamu alaikum i am presenting in a conference on monday about post-traumatic stress disorder and I'm speaking particularly about Muslim students. Um, and I'm trying to find the best way to frame that whatever is happening out there in Gaza is impacting our students here every day. And my best effort is to not get into that debate about like what is right and what is wrong. But my best effort is to talk about like the impacts that our students in colleges and universities are having right now, seeing their families dying, um, the impact on a general consciousness about worthlessness of Muslim life. It's, it's so important, it's okay to cry about two Americans killed, but it is not important to cry about thousand, like 30,000 Muslim children being killed and how that is traumatizing our students here and how all of that trauma trickling down is impacting their academic trajectory, academic success, and how they're not being able to perform well in exams, classroom assignments, et cetera. So I'm just trying to do that. Do you have any recommendations, suggestions for me? Uh, uh, are you in a public school or in a private school? What setting are you in? I'm in a private um, Catholic school. But this is uh, this conference is open to counselors, uh, psychological counselors, um, advocates, social workers, etc. Yeah, and uh, um, is there a, like at the Catholic school that you're at? Are there is there a good chunk of Muslim students there? Is that like kind of you're reporting what you're seeing on? I don't know. Is it on campus or is it a high school? Or so, uh, no, it's a private university where I'm at, okay. and uh, we don't have a lot of Palestinian students there in our university. But then the point that I'm trying to make is that whether as a Muslim I'm a Palestinian or not, when I see other Muslim folk being killed and their, their death and their misery being uh, taken as like as if it does not even matter that traumatizes me and that gives me a message about the worth of my life in this western world right now yeah i i and it's an academic conference it sounds like it's like a yeah so um you know the you know as as you know better than i it's not as if like the academy is you know lives up to the ideals that it sets for itself but there is definitely more space more room for debate on campus than there is in like a you know corporate workplace setting almost across the board and so you know that's that's like a social mores of the you know kind of workplace that you're in but there's not like a legal you know way to back that right so you're like a it's just the case unfortunately if it, you know, any private employer can fire basically any private employee for any non-discriminatory reason. And so I think that the what you're looking to present on, it, it, it sounds like it's in keeping with the expectations of the gathering, right? It's a gathering for counselors to discuss the challenges that their students are having. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yes. So it's it's you know within the topic, and it sounds like your your university is sending you there to talk about that. Is that or talk about 
the problems of your students or is your university sending you there to talk about what, what you'd like to talk about? So the conference is happening in the university. Our university is hosting the conference and uh, uh, I talked with the conference organizers. I've been presenting it for the last several years on, on this topic. And this year I want to add this element of how that trauma of ongoing conflict upon Muslims is impacting our students here. Um, so it's not university directing me to do or not to do, but I have my supervisor's permission to present in that conference. He's not yeah. seen my paper though. Yeah. Um, you know, it, I think surprises carry the possibility of risks, but it sounds like, you know, they have a sense of what you're, you know, presenting. I, I just, you know, try to use sober, restrained language, right? I think the atrocities are so great. The Muslim community in the United States feels it so obviously, right? If you look at the opinion polls, you can see that it's like the predominant concern to the Muslim community. Um, so, you know, it, it's, uh, I think the, you don't, you don't kind of have to, I think if you're, you're, you're picking the words, like the rhetoric that you're going to use to describe these things, just think about the possibility that somebody that's listening doesn't like you or is trying to do something mean or bad to you or your career. Could they take something, a little teeny tiny piece out of your presentation and spin it out of context? This is unfair. It's unfair that we that you, you have this, that we have this often, but the solution to that is to make sure that nothing you say can be twisted, right? To if you're going to say something, I think I, I've referenced Hamas a couple times here. Hamas is a designated terrorist organization. And so if I'm talking about Hamas, I, I put little qualifiers in the middle of the sentence. Not, I don't want to leave it to later sentences. I'm trying to bake in the thing that I don't want. I want the, I want clarity for into the language that I'm using. And so I would just, you know, sister, just think very carefully, do it. Just think very carefully about the words that you're going to use to do it. And I think that given how extreme the facts are, you can relay the same message with even like a restrained presentation. And also, if you can get someone to record your, uh, your presentation, you have easy access to refer back later in case something comes up. But you got to be careful. Sometimes uh, the organizers won't allow it. And then other times you can't record it yourself without other people's permissions. That's going to depend on what state you're in. Um, some states require everybody in the room to consent to recording. Other states require just you agree to, to record it. So I'll probably in that case, I will announce that I'm recording it, but I'll keep my own laptop facing me and the screen so that it's only me in the... Well, I, I think you want to think strategically about that decision itself as well. You know, okay. uh, when, uh, when you tell somebody, I'm going to record this, you know, everybody's like, okay, I better listen to for the worst thing that this person's going to say, because that's what, why they're recording it. So it, it kind of cuts, the recording cuts both ways. It, you know, can perk people's ears up. <laughs> and then if you do, God forbid, say something silly, now there's a recording of it, you know? So sometimes it's better to not have the recording, right? So it just, I'm just saying, not saying have it or don't have it, but I'm saying it's a strategic decision about doing it or not doing that you should think about. I have another question. I'm really yeah. thankful for the detailed guidance uh, from both of you. Um, in the original abstract, um, I mentioned that there will be students also speaking and none of the students is Palestinian. And we were planning to talk generally about trauma, not about Israel, Palestine. But now I'm thinking that if that conversation comes in, which I'm very sure will come in, one, A, I cannot control students' language there, and I do not want to control it there. So would it be wise for me to, in fact, not take students with me in that presentation so that 
I do not put them in harm's way or I do not have to take responsibility of their words or, you know, whatever. Because, I mean, they're very wise, but then I do not want them to be held responsible for something that they say they are. Uh, yeah, it, it, it lowers the stakes. If their students aren't there, it lowers the stakes. Then you're just dealing with the, you know, the grownups. And I think there's just going to be a little more latitude if the students are not around. Um, um, but yeah, it's do do other people bring students to speak? I think those are that's kind of a relevant consideration. Is that the type of thing that people generally do in these gatherings? So if if they do, then it's easier. If they don't, then it's harder. But regardless, all things being equal, having students present kind of ask like ups the formality, um, ups the stakes. Not having students lowers the stakes, you know, makes it, gives it more latitude. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Thoughts? Well, great. Well, we're, we're here for you. That's why we're here. Uh, we have a phone number so you all can call it. We have email addresses so you all can send us emails. And we were excited about uh, hearing about this gathering. We love Muslim chaplains. They're among our favorite, uh, you know, group of Muslims, you know, doing uh, space, um, doing service for uh, Muslims in, in, in so many different settings. Um, and uh, uh, it's important. Chaplaincy work is so important and our community is, is uh, I think, just getting started with it. And so if there's anything we can do to be helpful at all, please let us know. We're, we're, uh, we really want to um, be helpful. Thank you so much. Um, Jazakallah khair. Yes. This was very helpful, and um, I will share your contact information that you shared today Please. with our members, and so yeah. we will have that on deck if we need you guys for anything. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mira, thanks for getting this together also. Oh, I'm glad to hand out. And I see Sadaf's question. Um, yeah. yeah, about getting it. I'm assuming we'll have this up on the member resource section of the website as soon as the team has the chance to upload it there. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So, have you had a chance?